Very well, we are going to open your Bibles, if you will, to Daniel chapter 6. The title of our message, our lesson this morning, would be Undaunted Courage in the Midst of Adversity. Undaunted courage in the midst of adversity. Turn with me to Daniel 6 and verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Daniel was a man that experienced pressure. Tremendous pressure. Pressure to conform to something else other than his commitment to God. He never wavered. He never blinked. He was an example of undaunted courage. He experienced the pressure of being removed from his home, family, culture, any religious influence. Young people who leave home to pursue whatever, career, education, employment, are suddenly exposed to the world to the enemy of their soul, temptation, sin. Suddenly there's no one to ask them, where are you going and when will you be home? They realize they can stay out late become friends and run around with a crowd that is on the fringe. Things that they can, can do now, they would never have done while living at home. Young people who leave home not only put themselves out of the care and concern of their home. Many times they also leave the influence of a biblically ordered church where they can be under the influence of gospel preaching, godly living, spiritual care and concern. David left home. I mean, Daniel left home. But David, I mean, Daniel also underwent brainwashing. He was exposed to teaching that was geared to in every way change him. Daniel, along with other young men, were indoctrinated in the Babylonian culture and religion. It was purposeful to try to erase from his mind and memory 
and from his conscience anything having to do with the true and living God. I had the privilege and opportunity and blessing of going to Bob Jones for a year before for other reasons, I stayed home one semester and went to SMU. And for those of you who know that I was involved with the mission workout in West Dallas, that was the main reason. So that I could be here and help my parents. So I decided I'll stay home and I'll continue on my credits and education at SMU, which I did. I sat in the Bible class, which was a Bible class survey of the Old Testament taught by a man who claimed to be fundamental, but he wasn't. He made fun of the Bible. Literally made fun. Ridiculed the Bible. And I couldn't help but think as I sat there in that classroom, how many young people are in this class who really don't come from a very strong religious background where they have any deep, serious conviction about God and are being exposed to this professor who is literally making jokes about the Bible? Over the years, secular schools increasingly have aimed at wiping out the memory of God from the conscience of young people. But it's also true of even grade schools, high schools. Very prevalent. Add all of it together and you come up with all of the ingredients of a shipwreck about to happen. That's not really the end of the story. There's also the element of persecution. Daniel was persecuted for his religious beliefs. Many fall under the pressure of persecution Many are willing to sell the truth in order to avoid the frown of men. Many learn to value the smile of man rather than the smile of God. Then add to all of what we've been talking about the element of disappointment. Daniel 8, verse 27, we read, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. However, he did not allow discouragement to paralyze him. and to keep him from fulfilling his duty. There was the pressure of those who took it upon themselves to bring about his downfall. And as we read at the beginning, our text, Daniel 6, 5, these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Early in life, the 
most people are confronted with the reality of achievement, recognition, in a school setting, a job setting, they're getting some pats on the back. Good job. But there's also another element that's creeping in and we call it envy. People who are not so happy about your success. Young children are not always glad when their peers are recognized for certain achievements. It's part of the sin nature to become envious of others. And when envy begins to creep in, so does the desire to make others look bad in order to promote our own well-being. Even in families, there's sibling rivalry. It's a reality, competition, and much godly wisdom is needed to deal with it. What is sibling rivalry in the home soon enough becomes peer rivalry at school. When other students work and get good grades, their friends do not applaud them. They pick on them. High achievers are resented. They become targets of those who are jealous and seek to criticize. The same thing is a sad reality in the workplace. It's there. Those who work hard and are extremely productive make others who are not productive look bad. And those who are honest and above board in their dealings with others come into direct conflict with those who are willing to cut corners or even steal from their employer time or material things. It's sad but true that the very things that can make one an outstanding employee also make one a target or backstabbers. How can those things be dealt with? There are various ways they can be dealt with. One is take the course of least resistance. Just go along. Go with the flow. Lower yourself to the lowest common denominator. And at first that seems the easy way out. People become comfortable as long as you don't stand out or live by some higher standard that causes them to feel threatened. A second way of dealing with these realities that we've been talking about is to have a fixed determination to always aim for that which is excellent regardless of the cost. That requires backbone. That requires character. Be the kind of person that God wants you to be in that situation. It's not the easy way. But it's the only way of true success in life. According to our text, Daniel sought excellence in everything he did, and he served God in everything that he did. That caused him to be outstanding, but it also caused him to have enemies.
Daniel. Faced opposition, sometimes openly, sometimes not. There were other factors which made it very difficult for Daniel. He was what we might consider in our day an ethnic minority. And he worshipped God with his colleagues, which his colleagues rejected. Daniel was a Jewish man with a high position in the Persian Empire. King Darius, the Persian ruler, ran his empire by putting 120 officials. They were called satraps in charge of the various responsibilities. And there were three administrators over those 120 officials. And one of those three administrators was Daniel. Look with me to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 3. And see what's happening. Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Daniel 6, 4. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, the text that we read earlier, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Daniel's in a den, but right now it's not a den of lions, it's a den of, we would call it the labor den, full of sharks, filled with predators, watching for weakness, waiting to pounce. Men who undertook to get rid of Daniel. By finding fault, they figure everybody has a weakness somewhere, and if we dig around enough, we'll find it. So, they decided, since they would never be able to get him in trouble for doing something wrong, they would get him in trouble for doing what is right. and make right wrong. And that's the day in which we live. We're seeing laws passed. More and more they're infringing upon what is right and making right against the law. How did they do it? Well, they uh, sort of tricked the king into changing the law and said, let's make an, a temporary decree about praying. And after all, with such a benevolent king and wonderful king in government, who needs to pray anyway? That's not in the scriptures. I think it was in their reasoning. Why not outlaw prayer for a while? just to make sure everybody knows that the king 
is in really the highest authority and that the government is really the source of all good. Does that sound familiar? Faith and prayer have no place in government. Now, if you have been Daniel, what would you have done? In those same circumstances, what would you have done? If you're a person that is not particularly religious, perhaps you would have said, eh, I won't be able to pray for a month, no problem. I never pray anyway. Big deal. Or if you're a person who prays occasionally, you might have said something like, that's a dumb law. 30 days without prayer, but no big deal. I can always pray once the 30 days is over. Turn with me to Daniel 6 and verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went unto his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. We know the story, verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Of course, they couldn't wait to accuse him. The king was concerned. He had to uphold the law which he had put into effect. Verse 16, then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And of course, God did. And the king, in verse 23, exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because, why? He believed in his God. Not a scratch. Someone might say, well, maybe it wasn't God who delivered. Maybe the lions weren't hungry. Look at verse 24. The king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them their children and their wives into the lion's den, and they had not reached the bottom of the den before those same lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. The only reason Daniel was not harmed, God intervened in his behalf. Well, what lessons, what lessons can we learn? First lesson, regardless of the cost, be a person of principle. Regardless of the cost, Daniel was a man of principle. He was a man of undaunted courage in the midst and in the face of adversity. And not for just a brief time in his life. All of his life was characterized. He was a man of principle. 
In his early life, he was taken from his Jewish family and brought to Babylon where he was trained to work for the Babylonian king. But there was a problem. The young men who were in the training program were required to eat food and drink wine from the king's table. The royal food had been dedicated to pagan gods and violated the dietary laws which God had given to his people. Daniel could have compromised. Gone along with the other young men in the training program. But he didn't. Daniel made up his mind not to disobey God. Of course, you know, he got a different diet. They went along with it. Daniel ends up in better physical condition. Many young people getting started in life, first job, sometimes are tempted to the, in the position of making some tough decisions. How about working on the Lord's Day? Or trimming here and there to cut cost. You have a choice. You can stand for principle or you can sell out cheap. Give up your integrity in exchange for going along. Daniel chose to be a man of principle. Even when he was just getting started, Second lesson, aim at excellence without excuse. Daniel, like any other person, could have come up with all kinds of excuses. At a young age, he was taken from his family, his culture, his religious influence. He became part of an oppressed minority and faced attacks on his faith. Instead of complaining, he decided to make the most of his abilities in a situation, in the situation where he found himself. And God blessed. And God increased his abilities. Third lesson, be determined that pleasing God has the highest priority in your life. No matter how important and powerful your boss might be, God is the one who is most important in your life. Daniel's bosses ruled over vast empires and actually had the power of life and death over their subjects. Daniel's co-workers were shrewd and powerful and had many ways of ruining someone they didn't like. Daniel could have been intimidated, but Daniel feared God. And we must, dear people, always remember God's law takes the highest priority in our life. Daniel, what accounted for that kind of character, that kind of backbone 
his daily walk with God. He depended upon God for strength and guidance each new day. Daniel decided that he would rather be thrown into a lion's den than to give up the habit of regular prayer. That's the choice he made. Would we do the same? I think so often we are lazy enough to just not put in the time and the effort and we're not facing a den of lions that conscious awareness of God throughout the day that conscious desire and effort to please God rather than to please man. Here's something to think about. Daniel planned to pray three times a day. That was on his agenda. He did not let anything interfere. And you know, I think many times we lose the awareness of the fact that we allow so many things to rob us of our time. Whatever. And we give in, and we lose an hour, or two hours, or whatever. I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong. It's just that they take priority over things that should have the highest priority in our life. We give in. From the moment we're born into this world, we're subject to pressures of all kinds. And the Bible says the wicked are estranged from the womb. That means as soon as you come out of the womb, there are that remaining sin, that sin nature in us. Is it work? It's interesting. It says those who, who speak lies go astray from birth. You mean that precious little baby can lie? That's what I mean. Because soon enough they learn to cry in a certain distinct way to get mama to come when there's nothing really wrong. Doesn't take long. And it's a form of crying that mama thinks the doctor needs changing or hungry, whatever. And many times that's right, sure, absolutely. But mama's very discerning and can hear. And many times that little baby learns how to cry in such a way as to be less than honest. Not aware of it as someone might be older, but nonetheless, mothers will tell you, they know, they learn so quick. early in life. Learn to have your priorities that are God focused.
thank God for the restraints that you have as God provides them for you. And particularly young people should be very thankful that they live in a spiritual environment where God is in the home. And there's prayer and there's Bible reading and there's training and there's help and counseling. You're blessed. David was a man, I'm sorry, Daniel was a man. I keep wanting to get David in here. Daniel was a man that knew the blessing of pressure. He turned it in to serving God, even under all kinds of pressure to compromise. Let's think a moment as we close. Maybe you've already thought of this. Our society is increasing the pressure to conform. Sometimes very subtly, sometimes not so subtly. And there's a price tag that goes along with it. It's giving up convictions that should mean more to us than life itself. That's what we have in Denmark. Daniel was prepared to be thrown into a den of lions based on principle. He was a man that would rather break than bend. And we're going to see, I believe, in the time that we're living, I believe we're going to see increased pressures mounting. May we be men and women of character and backbone and willing to face the consequences to maintain a standard of righteousness and to obey God if necessary, rather than to obey man. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand these truths and to apply them in our daily life and help us as individuals, uh, help us as a church to be willing to take a stand for righteousness regardless of the price, regardless of the consequences. May we be individuals, may we be a church of undaunted courage in the days ahead. We ask in Christ's name, amen.